My name is Saj Lechtenwalner. I'm a research programmer at Rutgers University. And one of the things I get to do is work with ocean data to tell stories to the public. These next few slides are basically going to get into some of the details of how can we tell stories in a visual way using data. At Rutgers, I'm affectionately referred to uh, by the people I work with uh, as a data translator. I take the various data sets that we get and uh, visualize it and interpret it in ways that can be understood by a variety of different audiences. Uh, and so data translation is really the art of connecting people with data in such a way that they gain an understanding of what the data represents. But what is uh, data visualization? There are many kinds of ways of representing data, and some of them are, are very cute and funny, like, like this pie chart, which is nothing more than a representation of a bunch of pies in a refrigerator. This is perhaps the world's greatest pie chart, uh, representing the pie that I have eaten, the pie I haven't eaten. And it tells a very simple and compelling story that's, that's also a lot of fun. It's really important to establish an emotional connection with the viewer when creating a visualization. And I'm a big fan of chocolates, so I really connect with this image. And as you can tell from the previous slides, I also really love dessert. So we can do that. We can tell stories. We can show humor. We can have emotion and make the data bring that out so that that really helps engage people and really gets them to understand the material that we want them to appreciate. Data translation, I think, involves really two aspects. One is developing the story that you want to tell with the data set that you have, and also then visualizing the data. But I'm going to focus right now on really what are the pieces of data translation that are really involved in telling the stories. Visualization is a whole other topic that uh, we can save for another day. Fundamentally, I believe that the stories of science are written with data. And what scientists do is they go out and they ask questions and they collect data to help them understand what it is that's going on in the world. And that data is really the, the story of the world. And so when we try to tell that story to other people, one of the most effective ways we can do it is with the data that we have. So one example of a story that we can share with data is, is a personal story of our friends. And we can do that now very easily with our friends on Facebook. Uh, many of us have seen uh, Facebook friend wheels where it actually tells us the story of us. Who are our friends? Who are our associations? Who are our connections? And from a friend wheel, you can actually see the clusters of friends that you have and the groupings that naturally fall out, like your family and your college friends and your high school friends. And so the people that are associating with each other are clustering together. This is a visualization of basically network connections being built over time here in, in COSI Mid-Atlantic and COSI Networked Ocean World, where we had Janice McDonald, our PI, who years ago was really a sort of a lone educator on her own. But over time, she built established connections and collaborations with scientists and informal educators. And ultimately, what we have now in our COSI Center is a large interconnected group. And so this network diagram really shows us visually how our group has grown and the, the, the projects and programs that we've been able to accomplish as a result of that. Telling stories with data really has a long history. One of the most often cited examples is Florence Nightingale's coxcomb plot of uh, mortalities during the Crimean War. This was information that was found in lots of tables uh, created by the army, but the causes of what people were dying from was really sort of hidden until she created this visualization. It wasn't the wounds that the soldiers were suffering so much as the uh, the communicable diseases they got during the war or from the wounds. And some of the plots that she was able to generate really helped galvanize public opinion in changing the sanitary conditions of the soldiers that were out in the field. When visualizations tell a compelling story, they can really help gain public support for the cause at hand. As a data translator, you have to be aware of a number of different elements when creating your story and putting your data together to communicate your information to the public. At a fundamental level, you have the science, your actual content that you want to convey. But you also want to convey it in a way using knowledge from storytelling and how do you persuade people towards understanding your argument. It also helps to know a lot about programming um, to create a visualization um, based on the data that you have. And you also need to know a little bit about art and aesthetics to be able to make sure that the visualization you've created is visually pleasing and so people will be receptive to looking at it. And finally, you also need to know a little bit about usability and how people look at what it is you're, you're looking at. Can they understand it and can they use it? And this is especially important when developing interactive visualizations, knowing how people will use 
a website to dive in and explore a visualization further. Many of the visualizations that are being developed today are interactive and allow people to engage more deeply. And so all these five things are really necessary in terms of taking data and making it available to the public and to other users uh, as an end product. Data presentations can include a variety of different outputs. There are things like conceptual diagrams, where you're taking concepts and just diagramming them out. Concept maps and, and flow charts and things like that were, are really part of a field that's sometimes called knowledge visualization. Another way is to actually create data visualizations based on algorithms, that is, using programs to automatically create a visualization based on the data that you have and formulas and functions to visualize that information. And these are just two examples of many of the different kinds of ways that data can be represented. Our goal in COSI is to really tell the story of the ocean and also of climate. And as part of Networked Ocean World, we're also interested in telling the stories of ocean observing systems. And so fundamentally, we develop the stories based on the science and visualizations we have. But oftentimes, once we as educators and public communicators have a better idea of what we want, we can also advocate for better visualizations from the programmers and the scientists who are out there as well to create images that will be useful to our end needs as educators and public communicators. There's a number of key stories, I think, that we can tell that really will help people appreciate what it is we want them to know about the ocean and climate. And one of the big story themes that we can share is that of scale. And there are many different kinds of scales. There's a temporal scale, that is, what are the changes in time, such as glaciers that are receding, or the Mauna Loa curve showing carbon dioxide increasing over the last century. We can also look at changes in temperature over whole continents or the whole globe. We can also share with people stories of spatial scale, how big and small things are and put things in the proper context, such as how big is the planet Earth relative to other planets, how much water is in the ocean, how much salt. These are all examples of telling stories about size and quantity. Another theme that we can tell stories about is that of variability. How much change is there in time and space and in the variables that we measure, such as temperature. This is a great map that shows how much the temperature changes in the world's oceans between the summer and the winter. And we see a very interesting story here that many people are unaware of, that in the equatorial regions there isn't much change in temperature in the surface oceans between the summer and winter. But in certain areas of the world, like off the coast of the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast and off the coast of China and, and other areas, there are extreme changes in temperatures on the order of 20 degrees Celsius between the summer and winter. And that has dramatic consequences for the uh, life in the ocean and also for those of us who live near the ocean. We experience these changes as well. Another key story to share with people about the oceans and climate is the idea of the difference between a trend versus variability. And that fundamentally is the argument of weather versus climate. Weather is the variability that we experience every day, and climate is really the average of weather over long periods of time. And so when we're looking at climate change, we're really looking at the trends in those changes. Um, these are two fundamentally different concepts, and so that's a fundamental story that we as ocean educators need to share with the public. Ultimately, when telling stories with data, we need to make sure that the story we're telling is relevant to the people we want to reach, and it's relevant to the science concepts we want to get across. So when we can tell stories related to what's going on uh, in the news right now, we have a chance to really capture their interest and attention. There are a number of topics related to oceans and climate that people already have a connection to and have been exposed to and understand a little bit about. And a great example is sea level rise. We can show trends of sea level rising up over time, which only shows part of the story. People don't really have the context to put that information into practical use. But when we show maps of flooding and, and coastal inundation and where water levels will be uh, under certain flooding conditions or certain climatic conditions in the future where sea level might be higher, people can then take action based on that information. Storms also impact people in significant ways, and so seeing visualizations of storms, people understand because they live through those events and they appreciate the strength and enormity of them. People are interested in the results of the research that's being done related to these stories because storms and hurricanes and floods and these major events affect people's everyday lives, and so they're really interested in learning more about them. And another great example is the food supply. There's a great story we as oceanographers can share with people of how the oceans are connected to the land. 
the oceans actually do have an impact to uh, everyone in the world, no matter where you live. Even if you live in the middle of a continent, the ocean affects the climate and weather of the land that, that you live on and where our food sources is coming from. Visualizations like this really help us tell the story that the people on the planet are connected to the ocean and to each other. So ultimately, data translation includes both visualizing data and developing stories about that data. And there are several key stories that we can share with people to connect them to the data we have, including stories of temporal and spatial scales and trend and variability. So our goal as ocean science educators should really be to make ocean science relevant and interesting to non-scientists. And we can take advantage of the kinds of approaches I've talked about here to do this effectively.